Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome, listeners, to episode 52 of the Ad Nauseam Podcast, down here late night at the Vomitorium. My name is Dr. Jeff Winkle, and I'm here with my good friend, Dr. David Noe. How you doing, Dave? I'm doing well, Jeff. I am very glad to be here. I love Roman philosophy, love Lucretius and Stoicism. This kind of thing is right up my alley. Yeah. It's been a long day, though, i got to say. It is? Are you, are you, you're still enthusiastic about I'm it, I'm still though? enthusiastic, okay. sure, right? The classics are not going to appreciate themselves. That's true. That's and our I have job. To say, yeah, exactly. And mm-hmm. I have to say that the response to these episodes has been so heartening, so gratifying from all these uh, folks out there who like to listen to us talk on and on about the classics. That's great. I know. So it, we, can't, we can't disappoint the fans. No, we can't. Even at this late hour, we're going to bring it. We're going to bring it. Yeah. I was reading this week uh, some fellow popularizer of the classics. Yes. Uh, it was Victor Davis Hanson. Yes. You know, we know who he is. Mm-hmm. Uh, sent along to me, someone sent me one of his essays and uh, I read through it and um, he said, it's really the popularizers. He doesn't like to call them popularizer because it sounds too much like vulgarizer. Mm. He said, it's really the popularizers who keep the classics going. He says he likes to refer to them instead of that as expanders. Expanders? I didn't what? like I that. I don't like that either. It just sounds like some guy getting fat. <laughs> it does, right. right. Or some kind of orthodontic device. <laughs> Your children, have, my children have braces. I'm always purchasing expanders. Yeah, right, right, exactly. I really don't think that, with all due respect to... Um, VDH. Yeah, I, I really don't think that's what we'd like to be called. No, expanders. No. no, I'm thinking of, of like some some pair of like Sansa belt trousers that yes. just kind of grow with you. Right. Yeah, that's you okay. know trousers and suspenders. Yeah. You know, and uh, hmm. I mean, I get what he's saying with with popularizer. It can it can it can kind of carry kind of a I don't know kind of a low class quality to it. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's it, it it tends to mean the kind of person who doesn't have the chops, doesn't have the education and scholarly acumen to make it in the real world so they fall back on something that's less. Now, you know, I'd hate to think that's us. Who knows? Yeah. But I don't I don't really care for popularizer. But expander? No. No. That's a that's a step in the wrong direction. Exactly. How about broadener? (laughs) (laughs) I had to use a broadener once to clean out my garage and you know it didn't go well. So you had to broaden your garage? No, I'm just making stuff up. Oh gotcha. I gotcha. Well I mean that can be that's a challenge for us. Now I'm now I kind of I want to come up with a better term. I do too. How about it's a challenge for our listeners? Yes. Ooh, send it in. Send it in. Tell us you know what should we be called? A popularizer doesn't sound so good. Yeah. Expander has yeah, no, a, that's, that's off the table. A whiff of orthodontics. Yeah, sorry, Victor. A broadener. <laughs> There's just not a lot there. No. Well, maybe we'll have to come up with some neo- All right. neologism to it. That'd be great. That'd right. be great. But first... We got a shout out. We got to get our shout out in. Yes. Um, would you like me to give the shout out? Yes, today? I would. Yes. I'd like you to, to, to do this one. This goes to uh, Martin Schmidt, who uh, has contacted us from Augsburg, Deutschland, I believe. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so a hearty guten Morgen or guten Tag out to Martin. Right. Yes. That's in the Bavaria region, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you know, I have never traveled in Germany. Is I'm it- just reading the page. Okay. <laughs> But my sense of Bavaria is is like in the is in southern Germany. It's I, that's what where it's a bit more sense. mountainous, a little bit more uh, Teutonic, Teutonic, right? A little bit more romantic in some mm-hmm. degree. Yeah, so uh, a nice right. place to go, I, as I've heard. I'd like to go there. Uh, I've been to Saarbrücken once. Where's Saarbrücken? Saarbrücken's not uh, too far from the Strasbourg. It's almost uh, directly north, a little bit west of Strasbourg. So are we in Bavaria now? Yeah, I don't think so. I'm not, I'm not really sure. What were you doing there? We just... Well, we left Strasbourg, yes. and uh, someone said, you know, Germany is very close by. You, you should go visit Germany. Oh. Okay. So we drove to Saarbrücken, drove around town a little bit, stopped off at a grocery store, bought some uh, vegetables, some uh, Kuchen, cookies. I don't know what those are. <laughs> I'm making stuff up. I bought a really nice mechanical pencil. Oh, I, I bet you could find I some excellent mechanical pencils in Germany. Germans know how to make mechanical pencils. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. loved this mechanical pencil. You, look, past tense, you don't have it anymore? I subsequently lost it. Oh, no. <laughs> it's probably with my watch at Delphi. <laughs> You're just leaving stuff all over the uh, I don't want to talk about yeah. it. Did you get any, did you have any worst? This is my last question. Yeah, are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> I did not have any worst. <laughs> okay. The, right. the pun opportunities there are too rich. I know. I'm I just was, going to leave them alone. I was tossing a softball. Yes, but, I wow. know you were. So, guten tag. Yes. Or guten, older guten morgen. 
to our friend Martin Schmidt from Augsburg. Yes, excellent. Thank you, Martin, for listening and uh, for dropping us a line. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, David, what could you handle the opening quote? I can do this. Yes. Yes. What do uh, we got? So this is from Ovid, his Amores, and uh, it was actually uh, Mr. Schmidt who suggested this to us as the opening quote, which is very nice. I subsequently found out that this is included in the uh, Martin Ferguson Smith edition. That's the Hackett edition of Lucretius's famous work. Excellent. So it's right there in the introduction. It goes like this. Carmina sublumis tunc sunt peraturra lucreti, exitio terras cum dabatu nadies. So it's an elegiac couplet. And this is one of these very rare near contemporary references to Lucretius. Yes. Yeah. It's one of these nice intra, I say, I guess we'd say intertextual where yes. one poet refers to another. Could you read the Klein, the A.S. Klein translation for yes. us? Uh, Klein translates it uh, thusly. Then the works of sublime Lucretius will endure while there's a day left till the world's ruin. Yeah. Well, that's, that's quite nice. That's very nice. High praise from, from Ovid. Well, Ovid, you know, I, I have a virtually unmeasured uh, respect for his poetic ability sure it's just incredible yeah yeah no th- that's great so for him to say something nice about lucretius now i think lucretius was dead before ovid came into his own certainly so there's no real competition but i mean it's it's suggested that um um like a generation later lucretius's stuff is still out there and it's, absolutely it's appreciated uh, at least by the uh um uh, you know the smart set that's right yeah that's right. And have we talked about A.S. Klein? I think we've mentioned A.S. We Klein. have, many times. Yeah. Poetry in Translation is his website. And uh, really good stuff. Very good stuff. Yeah. Um, Definitely. So, so listeners, if you want to you can check out um, a huge library of classical works in translation. Right. Yes. Uh, A.S. Good, Klein. Good stuff there. Yep. All right. So what are we going to give the listeners today? Well, we're going to pick up where we left off, um, um, hopefully, if we can remember where we left <laughs> off. Uh, we're going to c- continue to look at Epicurean, Epicurean philosophy, and we're going to start digging in specifically into uh, Lucretius's De Rerum Natura. Yeah, the poem itself. The poem itself and see what it's all about. Yep. Or as I like to call it, with a nod to Don Henley, the heart of the matter. Oh, nice. Nice. I, would, I with a nod to Taco Bell, right. call it uh, El Chalupa Grande. El Chalupa Grande? <laughs> Is there such a thing? No, there's a chalupa. But there's not a chalupa grande. I'm sure you can get it in various, various sizes, all of them. But that is your they... current rendering. That's that's the best thing you got for De Rerum Natura. I didn't say it was the best. It's what okay. I got right now. El chalupa grande. Yes, yeah. Okay. The Don Henley, the heart of the matter. That's, yes. I like that. That's nice. Uh, that's yeah. what De Rerum Natura is, yeah. right? I, I'll repeat myself from last week since this is the review portion. Yes. A title is supposed to be descriptive, mm-hmm. tell you what's in the book. And it's supposed to be, in some ways, memorable. Right. Attractive. Correct. De rerum natura, on the nature of things, fails on both counts. But but maybe the heart of the matter gets to it. I like that. I like that. I mean, do you think that, I mean, that title, De rerum natura, we, we, do we even know that's the title that Lucretius gave it? Was that tacked on by some I think Lucretius scribe? Gave, it, gave it that title. Okay. Cicero responds to it, you know, later on with his De natura deorum. That's true. The nature of the gods. Right. And when, in Virgil ref, uh, uh, refers to him also in the Georgics along those lines. That's uh, right. The yeah. one who knows the causus rerum. Right. The, ca- the causes of things. Right. right. But it's a, weak, it's a weak title even from Lucretius. I think he, it was a swing and a miss from him as well. You think so? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's in Latin as in, as in a, a literal English rendering. It's, it's not all that catchy. It's a swerve. It's a, yeah. Yeah. We've got to talk about that later. The clean amen. Yes. All right. All right. So we need to begin, Jeff, then with a little bit of a review for things we talked about last week. Right. Let's talk a little bit about Epicurus and Epicureanism. Okay. Um, not not in too much detail because it's all there in the first episode. Are, are you saying I'm going to go into too much detail? I'm just trying to put the brakes on. Okay. Right. But you've shown restraint earlier in this episode. I'm hoping oh. you'll you'll show it again. All right. Yeah. Then. Epicurus, born in 341, died in 270. Right. Mm-hmm. He uh, developed the system of Epicureanism, which, as we all know, places pleasure as the highest good and pain as the worst kind of evil. So right. the goal in life is to attain the highest pleasure and avoid the worst kinds of evils. And if you can do that, you arrive at a state called ataraxia. Yes. Just outside of Cleveland. <laughs> I've driven I've driven around Have you been ataraxia. Through ataraxia. Yeah, exactly. It's no Toledo. No, I'll tell uh, I'll you. <laughs> But as we were talking last time, this uh, this issue of, of pleasure um, has mm-hmm. been kind of, tw- or an uh, an Epicurean understanding of pleasure has been twisted um, over the se- over the centuries. And um, Epicurean pleasure is um, spending time with your friends, 
Uh, you say as opposed to the caricature. A car- uh, to the caricature of a kind of hedonism. Correct. Right. Um, and you know, so for Epicurus, the greatest uh, pleasure in life was um, is spending time with one's friends. It's friendship. True friendship. True friendship. Yeah. Al- along the lines of an Aristotelian idea that a true friend is an alter idem. He's a, another same, right? It's a person of similar character, similar interests, similar tastes. And uh, because we naturally love ourselves, we like someone who is who is like us right. and has a lot of those qualities. Right, right, right. So opposites don't attract in, in this sense. No, no. You want to uh, be with like-minded people mm-hmm. who kind of share your interests and share your values, um, live a simple life, um, largely or completely divorced from public life. Correct. Yes. And, and that's how you get the ataraxia. So the Greek verb tarasso means to stir things up, to mess things up. Right to you know stick the spatula of human passion into the I don't know boiling tub of human activity. <laughs> you with me still? I was just reminded that the spatulas of human passion were on sale at Target <laughs> <laughs> this week. Go and on, you, please. You mess it all up. Yes, and you're, that's what tarasso means. The the verb tarasso. So the ah taraxia mm. means that you're not in that state. Yeah. No spatula. No boiling tub of human passions and interpersonal dynamics, you are removed from all of that. Right. So as we'll see, this is by way of prolepsis, anticipation. Lucretius says there's something really, really satisfying about sitting on the shore and watching uh, other individuals floundering at sea as they go down in a shipwreck. There's something, there's something, what about that? You heard what I said. (laughs) Really, really satisfying. Okay. You don't take pleasure in their uh, torture and um, destruction but you have a strong sense of what you have been spared from. Oh, I see. I see. And so you, you're, you're at peace, ataraxia. Oh. So this is different than the Stoic notion of apatheia. Yeah. So apatheia is you don't feel anything at all, no emotions whatsoever. You're kind of like a Vulcan, you know, you're Spock. No, no emotions, no feelings. If you have ataraxia, you feel things. Mm-hmm. They just don't tip over the apple cart of your life. I gotcha. Everything is equanimity. This reminds me of... Um when I went to see Titanic in the theater years ago. You've seen Titanic? I will not admit it on air. Okay. <laughs> yes. I was, I, was, uh, I was dragged to this film um, by the woman I was dating at the time. Who is now your wife? No, this is actually this okay. is pre-wife. Say no more. Okay, all right. And at the end of that movie, of course, you know how the Titanic ends, the ship, it goes down. Not oh, to spoil spoiler it. alert. <laughs> and we got into an argument because uh, I, I hated the movie. And and I, we had this argument about how I didn't feel anything for the people when Leonardo uh, goes down in with his arms people. outstretched, and, right? And um, but the only thing I found entertaining about that scene was I knew that I would soon be freed from this viewing experience. <laughs> so, Were people in the theater crying <laughs> oh, and weeping? It was ridiculous. This was in Chicago. Okay, and it was well, like, why do you say it like that? At the Titanic visited Chicago or something? No, no, it, it was it was like close to opening night. There had been a lot of buzz about that movie, so mm-hmm. the theater was absolutely packed. Right, and um, I could not wait for that thing to be over. Right, sink right. the ship already is right. what you were saying. So I took pleasure in I see watching people suffering oh. and jumping off the ship, but it was not. I wasn't reveling in their physical suffering. I was going, oh, this has got to be close to being over. Right, right. So that's a little different than Lucretius. <laughs> okay. I, I like it. <laughs> All right. But Lucretius isn't reveling in their physical suffering. He's thinking, oh, I'm safe from that. I'm safe from that, I'm right. I'm safe from that. And there's a kind of pleasure in seeing, you know, when you drive by the uh, car accident, you know, if, if you're a person of good moral character, hopefully, mm-hmm. you have genuine compassion for those persons. You might even pray for them. But there must be a little, a little bit of you that says, whoa. That was close. Right. You know, if I had not turned left yes. uh, instead of right, you know, 20 seconds later, that, that could be me. Right, right. Right. Can I throw in another pop culture anecdote? I throw away. Okay. Um, are you familiar with the band The Traveling Wilburys back in the day? Every episode, you ask me four or five questions if I know this or that pop reference. We, but The Traveling Wilburys, I think, are a legitimate supergroup. They were a supergroup. Bob right? Dylan's in it? Yes. Good. Willie Nelson? No. Um, no Tom Petty? Mm-hmm. Bob Dylan. Tom Petty. But hold on. Yeah. Bob Dylan. Yeah. Janet Jackson. Janet Jackson was, she auditioned what was cut. Okay. Right? And Roy Orbison. And Britney Spears. And, uh, uh, will you stop already? <laughs> okay. And Jeff Lynne. Who? All right. Who? Je- Jeff Lynne from Electric Light Orchestra. Oh, you need to go to that. Is he a musician? Oh, big time. Yeah. Producer. Be so indignant. 
<laughs> anyways, anyways, Roy Orbison, well, they um, they were in the, in the middle of being the supergroup. He had a heart attack and he died. Oh. Yes. And there's a story that um, as the news filtered out amongst the band members, right. uh, George Harrison, the former Beatle, who was also yes. one of the Wilburys, he called Tom Petty and Petty picked up the phone and without even saying any words of introduction, Harrison said, aren't you glad it wasn't you? No. Yes. I mean, that's the cheeky style of George Harrison. Ah, yes. the yeah. British wit. Is that the idea? Exactly right. That, uh, so was Petty one of the traveling he was. Wilburys? Yes. He also has passed now away. Now deceased. Yes. Yep. Yep. So hmm. there's just a few Wilburys left, not many. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, Their travels are almost at an end, at we an might end. say. Yes, exactly. So What are we talking a, about tonight? Uh, <laughs> this is Lucretia's Nifalor, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes. But Harrison okay. saw the death of their friend, and his little joke was you know, playing on the fact that, yeah, in that moment he was glad. He sad for his, for his friend, but glad it wasn't him. So that is ataraxia. There we go. Not disturbed by... Anything you retain equanimity. Right. So Epicurus, 341 to 70, developed mm-hmm. the notion of ataraxia. The three uh, philosophical schools of the Hellenistic era, right? Epicureans, Stoics, Academics are the third one. We're not going to talk about them. Mm-hmm. Those are the ones who are the, the skeptics, you know, uh, can't tell if anything is true. Go listen to the Gorgias episode, exactly. ladies and gentlemen. How many ships can your face launch if you want to learn about the predecessors of academism? Right. Now we come down to first century BC. Mm-hmm. Lucretius, our man, born in about 95, uh, died around 55. Right. And we said last time that what's really unique about Lucretius is that he brings these Epicurean ideas into a Roman context where yes. they clearly don't belong. Right, right. And um, that has to do with, uh, well, what um, was valued in society. That's right. right? The most maiorum. The most maiorum. The traditions right. of our ancestors. Right. Public service, right? If you're a Wilbury, you've got to travel. You can't just um, take your... <laughs> Is that going to work? Yes, I like it. Keep going. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can't just take yourself out of circulation. Right, exactly. Like right. That. Yeah, and you know, as we're talking about it, it, makes it makes me think that, I mean, Epicureanism must have been. Well, I mean, it certainly would have wouldn't have flown in. I don't think in fifth century Athens, mm-hmm. where you have kind of you know the um, the democracy, kind of the dust up of democracy, and kind of the expectation that all citizens would be part of public life. Um, I'm just curious how kind of how it. Um, and I don't think we we, did, we we didn't talk about this last week about you know how you know, Epicurus kind of sits there in that moment between fifth century Athens and really the the rise of Rome at right. its height. What was happening there that kind of allowed for this moment? For, you know, why did Epicurus's ideas take root then in the kind of post Alexandrian mm-hmm. time period? Well, I think we alluded to it. Did right? we? We, t- we? You you gave me some grief as is your want. Yeah. About uh, how I was being inconsistent, allegedly saying that architecture reflected human dynamics. Oh, yes, exactly. I said that this was the rise of the large a villa inside the Hellenistic city where right. everyone turned inward. Right, right, So right. out in the stinking streets of Pompeii or wherever the case may be, mm-hmm. you know, there's animals and livestock and all that kind of stuff. Sewage. Well, yes, I didn't want to say it, okay. the <laughs> delicate ears of our listeners. Uh, you then go through your front door and now you are in a paradisical garden right. on the inside. You're shutting out the outside world. Right. And then I think I think we also mentioned, you know, the rise of the nation state. Correct. Um, there's less opportunity for immediate public life, perhaps. And That's make, right. And makes this kind of turn easier. That's correct. Okay. So uh, those who are going to rule, they're a very small aristocracy now. Gone are the days of the real citizen soldier, the hoplite, who can come from humble origins. You know, the hero of Aristophanes, distinguish himself, and then take his role in the state. Those, those days are long gone. Long gone. Right. Right. So we have a second opening quote, you might say. Opening after 18 minutes? Oh, goodness. We're still opening? We're still opening. Okay. Well, uh, lay it on us, would okay. you? Okay. Yeah. So this is from the uh, Smith translation, Martin Ferguson Smith, published by Hackett. This is taken from the introduction. He says, Gaius Memmius, a member of a senatorial family and the husband of Sulla's daughter Fausta, until he divorced her in 55, had been tribune. Perhaps in 62. He became praetor in 58. We're going to get into the weeds here a minute. <laughs> And governor of the province of Bithynia in Northwest Asia Minor in 57. 54, he stood for the consulship but was unsuccessful. And in 52, after being found guilty of using bribery in the elections of 54, and who doesn't, (laughs) went into exile in Greece, where, as we shall see shortly, he showed himself to be no friend of the Epicureans. 
He is said by Cicero, who was on friendly terms with him, to have been accomplished in Greek literature, but scornful of Latin, and to have been a talented orator, but lazy. He may have been a lazy orator, but he was more energetic in another direction. His adultery with the wives of two of his political enemies, the brothers Marcus and Lucius Lucullus, is reported by Cicero in a letter dated 20 January of 60 BC. So the million dollar question is, why on earth would Lucretius dedicate this poem to this guy? Yes, that is the million dollar question. Right. And the answer that Smith gives is along the lines of maybe Lucretius was attempting to steer him toward a life of more moderation and constraint. Which I think is really interesting. So the, it's, the tract was not just about the whole enchilada, it was about trying to convert this guy. Now, we have no idea what their relationship was, right? No, no that's correct. No clue. Um, because he seems to be amongst the most least Epicurean of, of guys. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, I think Smith goes on to say, uh, which was an interesting suggestion, is he suggests that, you know, while Cicero may have admired his... His poetry, you know, there's that one little line that he leaves us behind that mm-hmm. says, there's great artistry in this guy, that in terms of philosophy, Cicero um, would have had very little use That's for correct. the poem. Um, but he says that uh, his friend Atticus uh, is uh, Epicurean, and that there might be the, uh, the, 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 link. the link. Yes, that's Titus Pomponius Atticus, to right. whom he wrote so many of his letters. Well, let me read a little bit of that uh, Cicero reference, Please. because Smith includes it for us as well. This is from the introduction. The merits of Lucretius' poetry were acknowledged at once, and he exercised a considerable influence on his immediate successors. We saw that already. I'm editorializing here. We saw that already with Ovid, Mm -hmm. and we mentioned it with uh, Virgil as well. Right. To continue the quote, Cicero, writing to his brother uh, on 11 February 54, comments, The poetry of Lucretius is, as you say in your letter, rich in a brilliant genius, yet highly artistic. Yeah. So he was making waves. Um, he was crossing. He was crossing philosophical lines. Yes. Um, he was widely appreciated. So uh, uh, how does it go? You put a little bit of honey around the rim. Yep. To make the medicine go down. That's right. And so it was appealing to someone like Cicero, who otherwise would have no interest in Lucretian philosophy. Right. And he, he, we, I mean, Cicero must have appreciated it on a um, uh, kind of purely linguistic level. I mean, Cicero, oh, yeah. I mean, Cicero as, as you know, one of the major shapers of Latin as a literary mm-hmm. language, um, as a spoken language, um, he, he must have seen something in Lucretius that says, yeah, this is my kind of guy. That's right. And Lucretius himself, about 130, 140 lines into book one, will talk about the difficulty he has in terms of putting this uh, system of ideas, taking it from Greek into Latin. Right. But before we get to that, we have to talk about the hatred of religion. I guess maybe hatred's not the right word, but uh, how he intends to set people free from the fear of religion. Right. When, Would you say that that's more or less the thesis of this work? Yes, the fear of religion yeah. and the fear of death. Right. The two go together. The purpose of religion is to reinforce the fear of death. These two twin fears together, they mess up your ataraxia. Right. So I'm going to read some of the Latin here, if you don't mind, starting on line 62. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Jeff's going to give us this wonderful translation from Smith. So it goes like this. Humana an tacolos foide cum vita jacerret inter riso presagravi sabre ligione, quae caput a caeli regionibus osten debat, ha ribeli super aspectu mortalibus instans, primum graius homo mortalis tolera contra, Est aculos ausus primus quab sistera contra. Very nicely done. Thank you. Right again, the dactylic hexameter, the epic meter. Right for this uh, for this poem. Yes, and uh, Smith's translation then. When all could see that human life lay groveling ignominiously in the dust, crushed beneath the grinding weight of superstition, which from the celestial regions displayed its face, lowering over mortals with hideous scowl. The first who dared to lift mortal eyes to challenge it, the first who ventured to confront it boldly, was a Greek. Yes. And who's he talking about? Uh, Well, this is Epicurus. Oh, that guy. Of course, yeah. Graius Homo. He was the first. It's really interesting to me that Smith uh, translates here from line 63. It's Graui sub religione. So the the Latinate among our audience who may have been listening, they may be heard in that second line. Uh, that human life, right, lay oppressed, gravi sub religione, beneath heavy religion. Mm. But Smith translates it as superstition. Interesting. Did you notice that? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Well, religio is is one of those those words that I mean, it looks so obvious. Oh, that must mean religion, right? But it's I mean, there's a there's a, a huge tapestry of, of things that are attached oh, yeah. to that, right? Especially if you're talking in in, the, in a Roman context. Sure. Yeah. Not only that, but it's like a bar of soap in the shower. Let's be honest. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's one slippery character. It is. You so gra- I think superstition. That's not. I, that's not a bad translation. Well, here. I think what Smith is trying to do is to to draw a line between true and false religion, right? Superstition is religio falsa. Mm. You know, the true religion needs no modifier, I suppose, if such a thing exists. Right. So I don't want to quarrel with the translation necessarily, but it's, but it's interesting, and I think it's it's thought provoking for us. Could an Epicurean have a true kind of religion, or is all religion inherently vitiated? By this fear. Forgive my ignorance, as you often do. Um, no, no, no. No, no, no. Uh, I mean, I don't I, I know. I never forgive your ignorance. <laughs> I, don't know a t- I don't know a ton about Epicurus himself, but was this, was this an, an ax that he ground the, uh, the, the fear of religion? Or, yes. This was something that was kind of, kind of uh, at the tip of his, on the tip of his tongue, at the end of his fingertips all the time. Right. Okay. Right. So he anticipated, you okay. know, the the uh, Marxian explanation of religion by, I don't know what, uh, 2,300 years right. or something like that. Right. Marxian or Marxist, I'm not sure which is the right term, but... The opiate of the Marxist. Right. Masses, Karl yes. Marx's statement that, you know, religion is kind of like the useful idiot. Mm. It keeps the, um, you know, keeps the masses at bay... And so it has some it has some use, but it has no truth to, truth it. to it. There's really nothing to it. And so uh, Lucretius is, I'm sorry, Epicurus. I think one understanding of his thought is that it's sympathetic to that interpretation. Okay. Yeah. So we go on from this then about you know the glowering uh, problems of organized religion. What does Epicurus? What does he do? Lucretius is hero Epicurus, Jeff. What what does he do once he notices? Uh, that religion is really the problem with her scowling gaze from heaven. Well, let me just continue on with the Smith translation. This is some heavy stuff here. Okay. Um, so he says, the first man to confront it boldly was a Greek. This man, neither the reputation of the gods, nor thunderbolts, nor heaven's menacing rumbles could daunt. Rather, all the more they roused the ardor of his courage and made him long to be the first to burst the bolts and bars of nature's gates. And so his mind's might and vinegar, vinegar, <laughs> sorry, maybe sorry. some of that too, vigor prevailed, and on he marched far beyond the blazing battlements of the, of the world. He's like a Marvel superhero, this yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. Man. In thought and understanding, journeying all through the measureless universe, and from this expedition, he returns to us in triumph with his spoils, knowledge of what can arise and what cannot, and again, by what law each thing has its scope restricted and its deeply implanted boundary stone. So now the situation is reversed. Superstition is flung down and trampled underfoot, and we are raised to heaven by victory. Yes. That's some heavy language. It is. Yeah, it's brilliant. So it's it's wonderful poetry. But the idea is, to, to interpret it a little bit, is Epicurus was the first man to dare to say, hold on now, this religion with all of its threats about the afterlife and what's coming when you die, all this is not based in reality Epicurus says. Yeah. And Epicurus goes on this massive thought experiment. That that's really what uh Lucretius is describing. So he he his mind's might and vigor prevailed, and on he marched far beyond the blazing battlements of the world. So in his mind, he took this big trip throughout the universe. Yeah. And he reasoned his way, not by observation, right? Not in an Aristotelian kind of let's observe the natural world, but through these careful thought experiments, right. he reasoned his way to the truth about all that is. And this, this, the way he describes it too is, I mean, this is more of the honey on the cup, right? He's describing, this is like uh, Hercules going, Her- Heracles going off to uh, his yes. labors, right? But I think he also, in addition to that, which I think is absolutely correct, he also has genuine admiration, right? Right. And this is, uh, what do they call this, you know, Fan literature? I don't know what it's called. Fan fiction? Fan fiction, yes. right. This, yeah. this is uh, Lucretius talking about his hero, Epicurus, the only person who was not afraid of the gods and their thunderbolts and all of that stuff, and he figured it out. Right. He went on the hard journey. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, elsewhere in Smith's, Smith's introduction, uh, he talks about these anecdotes of Epicurus when he was first gathering followers, and like some guy heard him speak, and he fell at his feet right. and, and, and worshipped him as if he were a god. Right. Yeah. So, well, it's partly the revolutionary nature of his thought. It was uh, so unlike anything else at the time. Yeah. It had this shocking effect. Right. Well, we need to continue with this. 
But before we go to the break, I wanted to float another possible title. Oh, oh you got one? You got I more? Do. Oh, yeah, yeah. What do you got? Well, this is from Dr. Seuss. This is from one of his books. Okay. Uh, the title of which is, and I think this works just fine for De Rerum Natura, The Shape of Me and Other Stuff. I like that a lot. That's brilliant, All isn't right. it? Yes. I mean, not on my part. That's Seuss got it. That's that's brilliant. The Shape of Me and Other Stuff. That's De Rerum Natura right there. Right there. This episode of Ad Nauseam is brought to you by the good people of Racial Coffee in Portland, Oregon. My friend, Mark Helweg. Did you know that Mark was my student? I think I did know that. Yeah, just briefly. Yeah, and he, right. he, he found his way from the classics into the uh, the, well, the lucrative world of coffee. Well, he, he continued on with the classics for a while at another institution. Yeah. yeah and then he, he just became this fabulous entrepreneur. Right. And he created... He created the Ratio 6 and the Ratio ra- 8. That's right. Two fabulous coffee machines. I've got the 8. I've got the 6. That's right. Just this morning, I brewed up a cup of coffee and uh, had a fellow come over to help me with some work on the house. And I said, would you like a cup of coffee? And he said, I'd like a cup of coffee. And I thought, you know, I am so glad that I get to serve my friend a premium cup of coffee and not some, I don't know, what should we call it? Hall bilge? <laughs> Exactly. Right. That's the way to lose a friend. Right That's there. right. Now, did you steer him into the kitchen so that he could see this beautiful? Yeah, he was working on my house. Oh. You stay outside and work on the house. I'll, you, you, I'll, you stay out there. I'll bring the coffee. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. So I, I you know, I uh, brewed up a pot. I let the water course through the metallic veins, come down through the Fibonacci head. I think the listener knows the routine by now. Yes. Off gas the CO two into the biosphere in the bloom stage. That's the bloom stage. That's the bloom stage, yeah. What, what comes next? Then the brew stage. The brew stage. Yes, and then so it's, it's a bloom with a brew. It's a bloom. <laughs> really again, really yes, yes. It's a bloom with a brew. <laughs> <laughs> And then what happens? <laughs> and then it's ready. It's ready. It's ready. Yeah. There's a little LED light that tracks across the bottom of this gorgeous machine. Right. How would you describe its aesthetic? It's it's sleek. Sleek. It's uh, modern, mm-hmm. but uh, not too modern. No. It's uh, it looks great on my countertop. No jagged edges, modern. No. It's it's very smooth. Um, my Full- my kids like to watch it in action. Oh, they, yeah. It, 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 it's silently kind of, you know, Are they going back to school this fall? Or are they just going to stay home and watch just the ratio? I, I got a special, uh, um, I guess I got special permission for them just to watch the machine. Okay. Yes. You get assign them homework afterwards. <laughs> right. Here, get them started on coffee. Yeah, question one, what comes after bloom? <laughs> right. But no, it's a, it's a beautiful machine. It makes great coffee. Um, I mean, the difference between... The coffee that this machine makes in my previous machine, it's night and day. Night and day. Yeah, great you stuff. probably are filled with regret when you think back at the coffee you used to drink. All the time that I right. wasted, yes. The hot, scorchy pad oh. underneath that burns it. Who wants to drink burnt coffee? No, no. And there's none of that in the Ratio 6 or the no. 8. No. Right. So what can our listeners do? Well, if they go to RatioCoffee.com, okay. they can order up a Ratio 6 machine, right. the one I've got, and get 15% off if they type in the code ANCO. That stands for Ad Nauseum. Coffee. Coffee. Coffee, right? Comes in how many colors? Um, but I have the I have the stainless steel. Yes, uh, there's walnut, I believe. No, 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 no. That's you're thinking of the eight. Oh, sorry. We're going to be running a special on the eight. Okay. So those who want the eight, which is the great granddaddy, hang on, hang on. Right. So. But the six comes in the stainless steel. Yep. The white and the black mat. That's right. That's right. Racialcoffee.com, fifteen percent off. Coupon code ANCO. This episode also brought to you by Hackett Publishing. Hackett Publishing, for the last 40-plus years, um, based in Indianapolis and Cambridge, have been bringing uh, wonderful, affordable, erudite translations of the classics. Um, and not only just not just the classics, but from many corners of the humanities and cultural studies. I love their translations. I have many of them on my shelf. I've used them in my own courses. Uh, Dave, what do you like about Hackett Publishing? Well, Jeff, I'm glad you asked. I am right now looking at Hackett's website. Okay, what do you got? And uh, it's just some amazing stuff here. We've got Margaret Cavendish, Philosophical Letters Abridged, edited by Deborah Boyle. We have Buddhism as Philosophy, second edition. So you see, there, there, it's not just Western stuff, Eastern right. stuff as well. How Do You Know? A Dialogue by Gordon Barnes. And then Classics, Aristotle's Eudemian Ethics, translated by the famous C.D.C. Reeve. Yes. This is in the Aristotle series. And Plato's Mino. So the gamut, really, of uh, anything that you could want for your studies. They got Asian studies, classical studies, the famous lingua latina per se illustrata, history, Latin American studies, literature, modern languages, pretty much everything. Everything. We got a deep bench. 
as the to use a sports metaphor. Yeah, that's and, that's from hockey. Is that? I, th- I think it's any 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 sport that has a bench. Any sport that has, has a bench. bench, right? I associate with basketball. But, okay, yeah. does badminton have a bench? Uh, yeah, it's just for when you got to sit down to take a break. Right. Yeah, <laughs> you're huffing and puffing out there. <laughs> <laughs> so what should the listener do? Well, if you want to take uh, advantage of this, go to hackettpublishing.com. It's H-A-C-K-E-T-T publishing.com. And you can get, I believe it's 20% off yeah. and free shipping. Right. First, they have to set down the racket and the shuttlecock. Exactly. Right. That's good advice. And whatever you're Absolutely. doing. Absolutely. <laughs> right. And then they get 20%, 20%, 20% and free shipping. That's a large number. It's huge. It's huge. And free shipping. And they have to enter a coupon code, Yes, though. which I believe is uh, A-N... Uh, two, zero. two zero two one. That's right. That'd be the current year. That is. All right. Check it out. And finally, this episode also brought to you by Odd Ostra Roasters. Odd Ostra Roasters is a veteran-owned specialty coffee roaster located in Hillsdale, Michigan. Founded in Kansas in 2018, Odd Ostra Roasters takes its name from the Kansas state motto, Odd Ostra per Aspera, to the stars through adversity. This morning, I brewed up for, uh, for the first time the, the Whitney blend. Yes. And it was it was nice. It was very good. It, Named it, after a uh, Hillsdale College student and Civil War hero. Yes. Now, has that moved up your list your, on your ranking well, it's board? It's a strong second. It's it's not at Tenebris level, but uh, delicious coffee. Nutty, rich, earthy aroma. Very, yeah. very good. Very good stuff. Yes. Excellent. So, uh, listeners, the attractive packaging to the poetry series is also a really great option for those wanting to read a great poem while drinking even better coffee. So head to oddastraroasters.com, A-D-A-S-T-R-A roasters.com, and you get 10% off, 10% off your any order when you put a... 15. 50, sorry, 15. 15, right. Even, I hate I hate to... Well, I love to correct you, but 15%. Yeah, even better uh, when you put in the coupon code A-N-A-A at checkout. Okay, Jeff, as we get back into it, you know, I got to take a step back. You do? Yes, there's a little bit here at the beginning of book one that, you know, I neglected to put in its proper order. Mm -hmm. And it's just such a delicious little episode. You can't leave it out. I can't leave it out. I I feel like we would be robbing the listener of uh, something that's truly remarkable. All right, well, take us there. All right, so I'm going to read a little bit of the Smith translation. Meanwhile, this is part of the invocation, that is... Lucretius talking to Venus, meanwhile, caused the barbarous business of warfare to be lulled to sleep over every land and sea. For you alone have the influence to obtain for mortals the blessing of tranquil peace. Since barbarous war is the province of Mars, mighty in arms, who often stretches himself back upon your lap, vanquished by the never healing wound of love, throwing back his handsome neck and gazing up at you in open-mouthed wonderment, he feasts his greedy eyes with love, and as he reclines, his breath hangs upon your lips. As he rests upon your holy body, bend, goddess, to enfold him in your arms, and from your lips, worshipful lady, let a stream of sweet, coaxing words flow in an appeal on behalf of the Romans for placid peace. Hmm. For at this... Oh, I'm not done yet. Okay. Okay. For at this perpetuous time in my country's history... I cannot tackle my task with tranquil mind, and the gravity of the situation is such that the noble descendant of the Memei, that's Memius, cannot fail the cause of public security. So we have that, that reference there. He talks about the, uh, the tempestuous times. This is right. a, a way of, of kind of solidifying the dates of, of Lucretius. So he's living in that time, that turbulent time of civil war, and um, where everything's being kind of tossed on its head. Yes, um, this, towards the end of the middle of the of the first century. Right. So this is the second generation, right, of the civil war. The first was of uh, uh, Sulla and Marius. Mm-hmm. Now this is the triumvirate, right? He died in fifty five. So they're coming up now on um, Pompey and Caesar and Crassus. Crassus yeah, going to duel it out. He died before the third wave of civil war came on. But this is such a lovely poetic device. Venus is the one whom he invokes. And she is ostensibly the mother of all the Romans through Aeneas, but they're devoting all of their love and passion to Mars, the right. god of war. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think this is this is really interesting. I, I just want to I point out a couple of things. Is you know, in uh, last week's episode, we noticed how Lucretius presents Venus as almost a a kind of a syncretistic goddess. A goddess more like Demeter, or, or broadly some goddess of, of nature. And what I think is so interesting is that, so he, he gives us this Venus from, you know, 
you know, Greco-Roman mythology, but he's, 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 he's messing with their identity a little bit. And in the passage you just, you just read, he shifts it back to kind of that classic portrayal of, of Venus with her, her lover Mars. Right. And so it's... Not it, her husband. Not her husband. Hephaestus. Right, Vulcan. Right, but Mars, with whom she was caught in adultery. Yes, and the second thing I I, I want to point out is is just uh, um, how Mars was such a much more important god to the Romans than Ares was uh, for the Greeks. You know, Ares mm. for the Greeks what represented kind of you know, the, the madness, the wildness of war. But there's that scene in the in the Iliad where. Ares is wounded, and he goes up to Olympus, and he, Zeus says, you know, more or less, I know you're my son, but I hate you too. Yeah, right? you're a brutal dullard. Yes, right. Whereas Mars was uh, much more kind of front and center in the in the Roman pantheon uh, as a god that could be uh, in service to the Roman the the Roman um, project. Yeah, it, to the state. Yeah. So there was the Temple of Mars Ultor, right? Mars the Avenger. You're exactly right. Very mm-hmm. important. And so now Lucretius very cleverly says... I'm going to invoke Venus, and I'm going to talk about how uh, Mars is in Venus's arms, and I'm going to plead with Venus to just calm him down a bit. Mm-hmm. These mad Romans with their carnage and slaughter and killing, this kind of almost pacifistic impulse is, again, very un-Roman. Right. Yeah, I, I w- that, that also struck me, too. It's like, yeah, again, how would this have, have played? You know, I know that, you know, after, um, you know, the dust settles in Augustus, you know, finds himself in charge. I mean, this is long after Lucretius's death. Right. Um, not not too long. Not too I long. Mean, I mean, a couple between of, couple fifty-five decades. and thirty-one. It's just about twenty-five years. Right. Or so. um, I mean, Augustus does make a show, a show of um, displaying Mars. You know, seated with the, his shield at his side. This yes. is you know, Mars at rest. This is uh, in the Arapacus. Is uh... I I don't I can't remember where it's it's okay. from. Um, but you know, Mars is a as a peace bringer. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, we're we're still years away from that. Right. right? We're in the thick of it. Um, when when Lucretius is writing it. Yes, and if the listener is interested in art, and why shouldn't you be, Right. Uh, you want to go online and check out the painting by Botticelli, Mars and Venus. So this is uh, 1485 or 1483, and uh, it's in the National Gallery in London. So on the left-hand side of the image is Venus, whose foot is kind of oddly elongated in order to frame oh, the whole right. picture. You that's remember right. that? Yes, yeah. And she's wide awake and looking lovely like she does in the... Uh, the Birth of Venus, also by Botticelli. And far off on the right is Mars, whose head is kind of lulled back, and he doesn't look at all like a warrior. He's completely just, you know, dissolved in love. Meanwhile, there are all these little fawns that are sneaking around with his armor and his helmet and They're his playing lance. with his stuff. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah It's yeah. so funny, and yeah. it's clearly inspired by this very passage. It's yeah. It's directly from there. Exactly. It's such an interesting idea that, you know, um, Venus too. I think this uh, Aphrodite is a goddess who's been largely misunderstood or kind of mistranslated through the ages. You know, we think of her generically as a goddess of love, but she's a destructive goddess. Right. You know, that, that love is terrible and uncontrolled. It's uncontrolled. You know, the uncontrolled passions. But this idea that these two uncontrolled deities uh, kind of cancel each other out. Would when you they... like? Would you like me to connect this? Artfully to an earlier portion of this very episode. I would like that very much. Okay, Roy Orbison, "Love Hurts." Love. Love, I really, I think you're thinking of uh, Love Hurts is by Nazareth. No, Love it's Her- Roy Orbison. Would you sing a little bit? Then? I can't remember all the words. <laughs> you know this song is by Orbison. Come on, I think you're. I think you're right. It, I'm the the one that always pops in my head when I hear that title is the one by Nazareth. But Nazareth. I think it's, it's a okay. cover of the same. Of, of That's the song. a metal cover, right? Well, I mean, they were they were a metal band, but this is where they're, they're one ballad. Ballady. On yeah, exactly. Love is like a cloud, holds a lot of rain. There you go. Very that's nice. That's it, isn't it? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Was I a little pitchy? No, I, I don't want to go all Randy Jackson on you. but uh... <laughs> All right, so we took care of that. We got the Venus and Mars episode in like we wanted to. Yes. Now we skip ahead to Iphigenia at Aulis. Right. Um, and you're going to read some of that for us? Yes, I will. The dangers and the horrors of religion. Here we go. In this connection, I fear that you may be, perhaps imagine that you are starting on the principles of an irreligious philosophy and setting out on a path of wickedness. It's kind of, I like how he kind of anticipates um, uh, lots of uh, the, the main objections of, of, of criticism that. Right. Yeah. You're going to put down religion, what? Lucretius? How Come da- on. How dare you? But he goes on, but in fact, more often, it is that very superstition that has perpetrated wicked and irreligious deeds. Consider how at Aulis, the elite of Greece's chieftains, the flower of its manhood, foully polluted the altar of the virgin goddess of the crossroads with the blood of Iphianassa. 
As soon as the ribbon had been fastened about her virgin locks so that it flowed down either cheek in equal lengths, and as soon as she had noticed her father standing sorrowfully before the altars, and near him attendants trying to keep the knife concealed, and the people moved at the sight of her to streaming tears, struck dumb with the dread, and sinking on her knees, she groped for the ground. Poor girl! Little could it help her that at such a time that she had been the first to give the king the name of father, for uplifted by masculine hands she was led, trembling with terror, to the altars. Instead of being escorted by the wedding hymn's cheerful ring, when the solemn service of the sacrifice had been performed, she was to be immolated by her father, and fall a sorrowful and sinless victim of a sinful crime, cheated of marriage for which she was just ready. And all to what purpose? To enable a fleet to receive the blessing of a prosperous and propitious departure. Such heinous acts could superstition prompt. Hmm. That's some gripping prose there. I right. mean, it's poetry, but the prose translation. And the word that is used again there for superstition is religio. What Same word. Yeah, it's religion. I have to think that uh, Lucretius must have been familiar with Euripides' play, um, Iphigenia Aulus. Oh, definitely. I mean, the, the imagery is, is, is ripped from the pages. Yes, yeah. it's fresh and, yep. uh, and bright. But is Lucretius cherry-picking? I mean, this is a, this is a uh, I would say, you know, this is a brutal episode from Greek mythology, uh, out of many brutal episodes, but I think kind of unique in terms of like a human sacrifice. Right. right? Um, is well, I a, usually like to tell my students, as I'm, I'm sure you do too, there are a few things that the Greeks say they never do, right? Typically, uh, no incest and no cannibalism, which is always connected to human sacrifice. Right. And they say these are uniquely Eastern things. Now, I'm sure they're not, mm. but that's how the Greeks view themselves. Mm -hmm. And yet, all throughout their literature, those are the themes, right? Incest, Oedipus, and human sacrifice uh, attached to cannibalism. Mm. Mm -hmm. But is Lucretius cherry-picking? Because we can all think of the excesses of religion. We can think of instances where Religion did uh, bring suffering and hardship, but is that all religion is? Right. Yeah. I mean, in in that regard, yes, he, he's cherry picking here. But I think, you know, for his broader purpose, um, I think he makes the point he wants to make, and, and he moves on from there. I mean, I think he's this is this is part of that that kind of that promise of the of the honey on the cup. He uses a kind of a grand dramatic episode uh, to kind of build his argument off. Um, I, I I can imagine. You know, philosophers of the day picking this up and saying, "Well, come on, Lucretius, I, I, what are you trying to do here? Is, is this a serious argument, or, or is this just kind of a, a more kind of a, a fanciful, uh, dramatic approach to your Epicureanism?" Mm. What do you think about the underlying claim, though? Uh, are you sympathetic to it? On the whole, religion does more harm than good. No, I, I mean, I, I don't think this is a good uh, a passage that that illustrates that very well. I mean, okay. I, when I when I teach this episode. Um, it's always more about um, kind of the immorality of Agamemnon uh, than it is about the... Um, so this is a one-off, in other words. Right. The, the, Human sacrifice, killing one's own daughter, this is not part and parcel of Greek religion. No, not at all. And it's not, um, you know, he, uh, he mentions the virgin goddess of the crossroads, um, a liminal place, by the way. <laughs> uh, this, this is Artemis, this is Diana, right? And um, this, is, this is really an outlier for her as well in terms of of kind of her portrayal in, in, in mythology and Greek religion too. Hmm. So. so now we look at what we were talking about before, right? The difficulty for a Latin poet to get these Greek ideas into the Latin language. Right. And as we mentioned, Lucretius talks about it quite self-consciously, and he does so uh, long about line 136. Shall I read a little bit of that? Please do. All right. So he says, I am wide awake to the difficulty of the task of illuminating the obscure discoveries of the Greeks in Latin verse. The main obstacles are the inadequacy of our language and the novelty of my subject, factors that entail the coinage of many new terms. But your fine qualities, Memmius, his patron, and the hope of gaining the pleasure of your delightful friendship spur me to make a success of my task, however laborious, and induce me to forego sleep and spend the still calm of the night in quest of words and verses that will enable me to light the way brightly for your mind and thus help you to see right to the heart of hidden things. He's, he's like an undergraduate. Yeah, just staying up all Lucretius night. Lucretius is pulling an all-nighter. Right. For the sake of Memmius, because he wants his friendship. Wants his friendship. He also wants his money. That's right. But he also wants him, in that last line, he wants him to kind of come around to the truth. As That's he, right. As he sees it. Yes. Yeah. Did you notice that in the last bit there, we have another 
perfect title for De Rerum Natura. I missed it. What, what, am I, what did you the see? The last little bit there. The Heart of Hidden Things. Oh, I like that a lot. That is good. Be a great title for a... Um, for an album. You think so? Album, novel, yes. Oh, here's another suggestion yeah. with uh, apologies to Jerome Kern, and that would be All the Things You Are. All the Things You Are. Do you know that song? I don't know that one. Yeah, it's uh, it's jazz. Okay. You forgive me for the rare jazz reference. <laughs> you know, I, I dislike jazz almost as much as I dislike musicals. Really? Okay. Yeah. All the things you are that that catches it doesn't it? It is catch Though I like I'm now I'm the heart of hidden things. That's 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 in my top slot right mm-hmm. now. Yeah. All right. Perfect. All right, Dave. So the last thing we want to cover tonight um, is um, a bit of atomism, right? Yes, we want to talk a little bit about Lucretius's view of how things come to be. Okay. And so the, the atoms and the void they're an important part of that. So here in Book 1, he's talking specifically about how is it that the world has the shape that it has? Why is it filled with so many different creatures? And so on and so forth. And he has a view, which is a very clear denial of what in Christian terms is called creatio ex nihilo, Mm -hmm. creation from nothing. Yes. He has a view that there are seeds, these semina, that are buried deep in uh, the structure of the world. And they grow up and they come to fruition and they ripen. And they give birth to all the different forms that we see. So some have seen in this, uh, you know, a a strong precursor of a Darwinian understanding of the world's origin. Right. And everything is seeded into the world. And over time, they kind of develop on their own. And they they come to be all of the different creatures in the different places. But he doesn't have a a give us a prime mover. No. Unless you want to say Venus. No, no. You're right. Right. So the gods exist for Epicurus. But they are comprised of very fine divine atoms. He's a materialist. Uh-huh. So your atoms and my atoms, no offense, I don't want to get too personal, they are uh, they're blockish <laughs> and they're rough. And this is why I can see you and vice versa. Mm-hmm. But the gods are made of atoms too. And their divine atoms are very fine and they, they flow around just like they should. And this, this makes them invisible. Gotcha. So even the gods are made out of a material substance, but it's just gossamer it's too fine for us to see with our puny eyes right yeah so then he'll say along about line 270 now then i have taught that things cannot be produced from nothing right so nothing comes from nothing right nil ex nihilo and also that once born they cannot be reduced to nothing right so there's a permanence of matter once matter comes into existence it can neither be created or destroyed Mm -hmm. and uh, it it, I guess, was always eternal. This is um, resonant with Aristotle's idea of the eternality of the world. The universe has always existed. It did not have a beginning. Yes. That, that's Lucretius's idea. Mm-hmm. So the whole of the world then is divided up into these two things, atoms and the void, right? This big space. And atoms are falling through the void. And smashing into each other. Occasionally smashing into each other. Yeah. That's correct. And this is a kind of deterministic, as all materialist philosophies tend to be, a deterministic view of all of life. If you can trace where the uh, cue ball, not the cue ball, the billiard ball, where it goes from one side of the table and hits the next one, then it hits the next one. If you can trace it all the way back to the beginning, you can explain every motion in the world. Except for what moved the first ball in the first place. That's true. Yeah. There's also a very important idea that uh, we haven't, I, I just mentioned it, alluded to it, and that is the notion of the swerve. So we'll have to talk about it in the next episode, but Lucretius is desperate to uh, retain some concept of human free will and freedom. And he does this by talking about this notion called clean men or swerve. So when you want to make a decision, Jeff, when you want to listen to Nazareth instead of Roy Orbison... <laughs> Uh, amazingly coincident with your desire to make that decision is a swerve of one of those material atoms. And they happen at the same time, and thus your free will is obtained. So you're, you're in control of your own atomism to some degree. No, you can't control it, but it just so happens that when you want to make a decision, there's the proper kind of swerve that occasions a free choice. Okay. It's, I mean, it's not completely fully understood, and it's not easy to explain. But Dave, what if we want a deeper explanation? Well, I would recommend that you go to one of the many fine books by A.A. A. Long. A.A. A. Long, okay. A. Anthony Long, A.A. A. Long. He's a, a very famous classical scholar. He's an um, Americanized Brit, so he came over to this big country. And uh, he has written extensively along with a fellow named Sedley, Long and Sedley, on all aspects of Epicureanism, 
Hellenistic philosophy generally, Stoicism. He's an expert in Stoicism. Mm. And I have a funny story about him. Oh, do share. Well, I was a grad student, so go listen to that episode, right? <laughs> 41 things I hated about grad school. <laughs> yeah. And long came to the University of Iowa, where I was studying Cicero and Stoicism. And uh, A.A. Long went into the men's room, and I thought, here's my chance. I could talk to him in person. You did? You followed him into the bathroom? No, I didn't follow him into the bathroom. Yes, you did? No, he was just giving a lecture, and we both had to use the facilities at the same time. Okay. So we're washing our hands, and and I had this burning question, so I just asked A.A. Long the question I didn't get to ask him. Uh, during, you know, the, the, the Q&A, Q&A yeah. after the lecture. Right. And I found out afterward that it was that question that impressed him. Is that right? Yeah. One of my, one of my advisors said, you know, you made a really good impression on Long. I said, well, what was it? It was a question you asked him in the bathroom. <laughs> do you remember the question? No, of course no. <laughs> not. But I do know that you got to be persistent about these things. Definitely. So did you say, so, AA? <laughs> <laughs> How'd you refer to him? Was it I, uh, probably Professor Long? Professor Long, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's he's a big deal, right? Yeah. So I, I was glad to get that praise, even if I had to work really hard. That's great you know, for that. That's great that interaction. Yes. Well, Jeff, we got to wrap it up, don't we? We do. Where have we been in this episode? We, we've been all over the place. When, right. When you're talking about everything, you're going to go a lot of places. Speaking of which, yes, I got another title for you. Yeah. So this is uh, this is one, I don't know what the reference is, where this comes from. Maybe one of the listeners does, but De Rerum Natura, Turtles All the Way Down. Turtles, I've heard that before, but I, I, I like it. Okay, that's yeah. all you got? Uh, well, Turtles All the Way Down, it's it's more abstract than, what was it, the the, the heart of things? What, what, what was the part? Did you like the heart of the matter, the Don Henley? No, it was the one from Lucretius itself in the translation, the heart of hidden things. The heart of hidden things. That's my favorite, though. But Turtles All the Way Down, I could be convinced. Yeah, that's some kind of a cosmology. It's a Navajo cosmology or something like really? that. It's Turtles All the Way Down. Okay. One turtle standing on another turtle. That's how the world is put together. I'm pro-turtle. Are you? Yeah. You didn't like the Seuss? The shape of me and other stuff. No, it's good, but I'm, I mean, I'm drawn to the weirder. The, the, so turtles all the way down. I'm, I, I think I'll take that over, Seuss. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we wandered a little bit far and wide. We did, just like Lucretius does in book one. In subsequent episodes, we got to talk about books two and all the way up through six. Yep. And so we got, we got a lot more to cover, but um, maybe not as secure as next week. What are you thinking? Yeah, I think more rectilinear. Rectilinear sounds <laughs> sounds right to me. Now, Dave, before we go, tell us a little bit about the Moss Method, would you? Yeah, I'd love to. Well, we're running a back-to-school sale, mm-hmm. and it's 15% off Module 1 or Module 2. We you know, we put our ads out there hoping to get some some folks who are interested in learning how to go from... Neophyte? To erudite. Yes. That's the catchphrase. And not just a back-to-school sale, 15% off, but I'm offering office hours every Friday. Wow. Every Friday, 10 a.m., if you are in Module 1... Or module two, you can hop on and uh, for an hour you get some some one-on-one or maybe five-on-one interaction with yours truly. You can ask me anything. Ask me about Homer, uh, Plato. I got a question about Homer this last time, uh, Iliad book two, 255, memory serves. Wow. Uh, New Testament, just anything. Anything. So helping them out with the Greek. That's, that's, that's that sounds the plan. Yeah. And, and act now. That's correct. Yes. Get that back to school sale. Go to mossmethod.com. We got some people to thank, Jeff, don't we? As always, thanks to our intrepid engineer Mishka, who sprinkles the magic fairy dust on this thing and makes us sound a lot better than we than we uh, actually do. That's right. She takes out all of the ineptitude. All of it. All of it. So thanks to Mishka. We got to thank our musicians. Yes, Ken Tamplin, Scott Van Zen, for all that wonderful rock and guitar that you hear um, throughout the episode. Yeah, Scott has a uh, a new album coming out. Oh, he does. Uh, I think it's entitled "To Trouble." He's very bluesy. Imagine, you know, I think I said before, Stevie Ray Vaughan yeah. meets. Um, Eddie Van Halen. Yes. Some incredible stuff. Yeah, great stuff. So, listeners, um, uh, subscribe, leave a review, drop us a note, Dave at adnauseum.com. Don't forget the V, uh, or to me at Jeff at adnauseum.com. Keep those comments coming. We love to hear from you. We love to respond back. Yeah, there's been some great ones. We're so gratified by the incredible response. Uh, people seem to like this, so yes. we're going to keep doing we're it. We're going to keep doing it. And if you'd like to uh, you know, show people that you are taking in and keeping down the classics, you can get a limited edition AN sticker. That's right, for three ninety nine. Three dollars ninety nine cents. Uh, go to our merch page, lurch with merch at nauseum.com. Jeff and I will hand sign it. 
hand sign it. So it's, yeah. it's not just a sticker. That's I mean, it's good no. enough, but this is a, a personal note from, from... We're not going to put ink on the bottom of our foot and step on the envelope? No. No. <laughs> We would never do or that. Or use a potato or something like that. No. This is hand signed. Hand signed, hand written. Check right. it out. Yep. All right. Next week. More Lucretius. More Lucretius. And at long last, we come to the gustatory parting shot, which is yours, Dr. Winkle. Yes. This comes from a certain Fuad Alakbarov, who once said, garlic is to my food what bass guitar is to music. Wait, 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 wait a minute. What What is bass guitar to music? Um, I'm saying, as a fan of garlic, I mean, I think you could read this two ways. That this is either an insult or a compliment, right? But as a big fan of garlic, he's saying it's the it's the key ingredient. A good bass line, a great bass line, can change a mediocre song into can you a give great it, song. Sing us an example, um, like that famous Queen bass line that was adapted by Vanilla Ice. Oh, the uh, for uh, another one bites the dust, right? That's an example of a very very simple bass line, right? But so catchy and so memorable that. Um, you know, it's it's a smash hit right away. And that's what garlic is to your food. I, I think I think so. I think that's what Fuad is saying here. And you agree. I agree. Alright, thanks for listening. Thanks. <laughs>